The Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals presents the timeless teaching of Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. Our study brings us today to the 8th chapter of Romans in the 26th verse. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Now it is as we grow in Christ that we learn the ways of God and know how to approach Him with holy boldness and with expectation and expectancy. We learn how not to pray and we learn how to pray. Over a half a century ago, the late Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, then pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, saw the need to spread God's Word beyond the hearing of his local congregation. He started the radio outreach which has become known as Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible. The application of God's Word as taught by Dr. Barnhouse is as relevant today as when he first taught over the radio airwaves decades ago. The message we'll be featuring on today's edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is entitled Growing into His Likeness. In years past, a successful craftsman would hire a boy to serve as his apprentice. The apprentice might make many mistakes at the beginning, but as he took instruction of the craftsman to heart, his work began to look more like that of his master. As we grow into the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ, we will understand how to avoid many common mistakes in our prayer lives and learn how to pray more like the Master Himself. The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Growing into His Likeness. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee for thy grace and faithfulness and ask that in this hour thou shalt use thy truth to bring unbelievers to the knowledge of Christ and to strengthen those whom thou hast saved through our Savior. We ask it in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the common errors among Christians is to take a a certain verse that is found in the Gospels and stress a purely English meaning of one word in such a manner as to give the text a wrong meaning. The verse I refer to is a well-known saying of the Lord Jesus, quote, If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven, unquote. The verse is found in Matthew 18, 19. Now I've heard Christians, even ministers, suggest that this verse meant something like having a desire for a certain thing and then asking another Christian to join you in prayer for the objective. The language generally runs like this. Now let us form a prayer covenant and agree on such and such. Then they conclude by citing this promise. If two of you agree, it shall be done. Now let's face it. If that interpretation be put upon the verse, then the promise simply is not true. Thousands of times in my own lifespan, I've heard people agree to pray for things which certainly have not been given by the Heavenly Father. It is often possible to show an error by reducing the argument to the point of absurdity. So let us suppose an absurd case. Two young people, for example, are going to the upper Amazon Valley as missionaries. They're about to have a child. They might say to some friends, now will you join with us in a prayer covenant? agreeing that our child shall be born without original sin. For God has said, if we agree, it shall be done. And in that way, we shall be much freer to do the Lord's work so that it will be for his honor and glory. Now, we know that believers could pray such a prayer until they were exhausted, but the child would be born with original sin like every other member of the human race. 
you will immediately hedge and say that the promise means that if two agree on anything that is the Lord's will, well, already, you see, you've reduced it to a rather weak duplication of other texts which set forth the truth that the Lord will do even for one person who makes no agreement with another, whatever is asked according to his will. Now, the meaning of this text in the Gospels is something much more wonderful. The Greek word for agree is symphonizo, from which our word symphony is derived. A symphony orchestra is one in which many instruments emit sounds in unison. But the word, when used by our Lord, is much richer even than this. For an orchestra is the sounding forth of many instruments, each controlled by a musician whose will is yielded to the conductor of the orchestra and the printed music of the score. The symphony of which the Lord speaks in the prayer promise would better be described in the following terms. If a song leader should say to an audience, we are now going to sing a hymn. Let every person think of a hymn, and when I give the signal, let all sound forth together. One, two, three, sing. And then you'd hear a hundred different hymns sung in all the keys of music, and the blaring sound would be a cacophony of discord. You can readily see that it would be a miracle of large proportions if at the given sound and without any preliminary announcement or use of instrument to give the pitch, the entire audience should burst forth singing in the key of E-flat, for example, and with the words of the hymn, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. Now, this is the supernatural background of an important phase of prayer. God has a work that he plans to do. The Holy Spirit dwelling in all believers, building them in spiritual life and in the knowledge of the ways of God, puts a firm desire in one heart and then in another heart to pray that a certain thing might be accomplished. These two meet and express to each other and to God the desire that has been aroused within them by the Holy Spirit. There is a tremendous spiritual joy in the life of each as they realize that God is really doing a work within them, conforming them to Jesus Christ, giving them a knowledge of his ways, a desire to do the will of God and to see him glorified. Many years ago, as I was preaching in my pulpit in Philadelphia on a Sunday evening, I saw in the audience a well-known Christian layman, George T.B. Davis. Mr. Davis spread more copies of the Word of God in his lifetime than any man I've ever heard of in the history of the Christian church throughout the centuries. When I saw him, I determined to speak with him after the service about a certain project which I thought would be useful to many missionaries. But when the crowd had passed me going out the door, I realized that he had slipped out without greeting me. I went to my home and I wrote him a short letter. I outlined the plan which the Lord had laid on my heart, and I closed by saying that I was going to mail the letter that night so that he would receive it in the early morning delivery, since we lived but a few blocks apart in the center of the city. Now, at breakfast the next morning, the mail was brought to me, and I recognized his large, scrawling handwriting on one of the envelopes. In his letter, he said that there'd been such a crowd around me that he had not bothered to speak to me personally, that then he outlined to me exactly the same plan that I had outlined to him and concluded by saying that he was going out to mail the letter that night so that I would have it first thing in the morning. A little later, my telephone rang, and there he was to express his amazement and delight at the coincidence. I said to him, Sumfanizo. He said, what? And I said, Sumfanizo, answering with the same Greek word. And then I explained that here was the true meaning of spiritual agreement. We had been the objects of this special grace of God and had agreed on earth, and we could be sure that it would be done by our Heavenly Father, and it was. The Holy Spirit joins the hearts of two or more of the children of God and strengthens their faith in the promise and their joy in knowing that they are in yielded relationship with God. And we can say without any hesitation or doubt that this experience has never happened to any two children of God without the spiritual desire which they expressed together, coming to certain fulfillment. Oh, there is indeed a sense in which a true burden cannot come to the heart of any individual believer without the answer being performed by God. 
Several years ago, I saw the remarkable conversion of a woman who was one of a large family of unbelievers. After a year or two, she came to me with a matter which puzzled her somewhat. She had a great spiritual burden to pray for three of her brothers, but not for the fourth. There were times that she was so burdened for one or more of the three brothers that she would have difficulty in sleeping, but she never had one thought of concern for the other brother. She told me that she even tried to force her mind to be concerned for this fourth brother, but that she felt her feelings in the matter were entirely artificial. I told her the story of George Mueller of Bristol, the great apostle of prayer in England at the close of the last century. When he was a young man, he had a burden to pray for three of his companions, and he recorded this burden in his diary and spoke of it again and again throughout his life. He died in his mid-seventies without having seen the salvation of his three friends for whom he had prayed so faithfully. But in an extraordinary series of conversions, these men who had outlived him came one by one to the knowledge of Christ, one of them in his late eighties. I then explained to her that it was impossible for the Holy Spirit to put a burden on the heart of any believer for the salvation of another unless God meant to fulfill the burden by answering the prayer and bringing salvation to that individual in divine and irresistible grace. She could be certain with the most positive assurance that she would see the salvation of the three brothers for whom she had the burden. I also told her that it was possible, though not certain, that the Lord might later give her a burden for the fourth brother. Now, she has already, since that time, seen the salvation of two of the three brothers. God must bring the third. If this did not come to pass, it would mean that the Holy Spirit had violated the will of God. Now, it can be seen from this that the intercession of the Holy Spirit is not the introduction into our mind of a casual thought that is little more than whim. That which God the Spirit speaks within us is sometimes no more than a wordless longing, a deep concern, or a great sweeping dirge without words to accompany the solemn music. We enter into the very love of God for those whom he has chosen, but who have not yet been brought to birth. We are brought forth in inner travail that we might know the will of God and the ways of God and that we might be conformed to the image of his dear Son. Now in all this, there is one question which constantly arises and which has been brought to me on many occasions. It's the problem that arises from the truth of the sovereignty of the all-knowing, unchangeable God and the place of prayer in that framework. Some people have the idea that God can be brought to change his plans by the requests of his creatures. Such a thought would mean that God's all-wisdom could be moved by human ignorance and that God's purposes were not eternal purposes, but rather the juggling of plans by an opportunist. It is true that the Bible gives us instances where it seems on the surface that God changed his mind. We must not be deceived by these instances and thereby deny the many categorical statements wherein God says that he changes not. The great fact of his immutability, his unchangeableness, is one of the most precious in the divine revelation. He changes not. But at times he has acted in such a way that it appeared to men that if God had been a man, he would have acted because he had changed his mind. For example, in the sixth of Genesis, we read that every thought of the human imagination was only evil continually, and it repented God that he had made man. Now, if it be argued that God had not known before he created man exactly what man would become in his fallen condition, then it would have to be admitted that God was then ignorant. This would be to deny the premise of the perfect God who has eternally known all things. And if it be argued that God changed his mind, it would have to be admitted that God was fickle, changeable, and that he was proceeding by trial and error. He condescends to express the truth from a human standpoint 
in order that we may understand the great changes that were taking place in his methods of dealing with men from one age to another. And now we ask and answer the question that is the most important of all the questions which could be asked in connection with prayer. What is the use of praying? We are often asked, what is the use of praying if God has always known all things and if the passage of all events is fixed in the plan of God? Now the question rises out of man's fierce desire to do something for himself. If he can't have a part in the changing of events, why should he pray, he thinks. The full answer to the true purpose of true prayer will answer this question also. Let me set forth the purpose of prayer with the following illustration. The chief actor is imaginary, though he speaks and moves in a perfectly plausible way. There was a man who was a great lover of violin music. He had wealth and had purchased for himself a magnificent Italian violin though he could not himself play the instrument very well. He furnished a music room in his house, and on his shelves were the scores of all the great symphonies and the violin concertos. He also had a high-fidelity radio and tuned in all the orchestra broadcasts which he could follow. One day he decided to take his violin and begin to play along with the artist who was about to perform with one of the great orchestras. He tuned the violin in harmony with a tuning fork, which gave him A on the international pitch. Soon there came from his radio the voice of the announcer, saying, You're about to hear the Philadelphia Orchestra, Eugene Ormandy conducting, in a rendition of Brahms' First Symphony. Our friend quickly took the score from the shelf and set it upon his music rack, and while he put his violin under his chin, the announcer continued, Mr. Ormandy is now coming to the podium, and in a moment you will hear... Brahms Immortal First. The first notes of the symphony came from the radio, and our friend drew his bow hesitatingly across the strings to bring out the first note. Beyond question, his violin was a quarter of a tone off the pitch that was coming from the radio. Now, what was he to do? There was no use arguing that he's correct and that the orchestra is off pitch. A fact is a fact, and if he insisted on playing in his own key, there would be constant disharmony. The first thing he had to do was to surrender his will to the will of the conductor, stop even while the music was continuing, and retune his violin. Well, this he did, and now there was the question of finding his place. And this again he did, and hesitatingly tried to play along with the score. He got two notes right and three notes wrong. He hit another note and missed some more. He screeched up an arpeggio slightly behind the beat, totally missed some grace notes, played through a rest, but drew a rather good tone on the last note of the first movement. He continued on through the symphony. Evening after evening, it was his delight to come to this room and to play along with the great orchestras. He played through the autumn, the winter, the spring, and the summer. Year after year, he followed this procedure, which became the delight of his life. He was learning musicianship. He knew that the scores which were announced were predestined to come out in a certain way. When the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto was announced, it was foreordained that the 76th measure would be played exactly as it was written in the printed score. There was no possibility that he could change it. If he imposed his will against the will of the printed score, there came a discord. He was playing one note while the orchestra was playing the predestined music. Everything was happening according to a definite plan. The result was harmony. If he wanted gay music when the score called for somber music, there was no use in insisting. The somber music would sound forth from the loudspeaker. He would have to choose between yieldedness and noise. The years passed. He was now becoming a tolerable artist. He was not yet ready to play in the great orchestras, but he had peace in his own soul as he learned the inwardness of the music. Now I am sure that by now you can see the analogy. Our God is the author of history, and surely he knows all that is coming to pass, and he has planned all things for his glory. The plan is an eternal one, and if we use the language of the Bible, it is a predestined one. Prayer is our instrument, our violin, on which we can bring ourselves into harmony with God. We are not in tune with him until we have begun at the cross of Jesus Christ and have submitted ourselves 
to the demands of God's divine justice and his grace as set forth in the atonement. From that time on, he is calculating everything in our lives in order that we might be conformed to the image of his son. He wants to bring us into perfect submission to the father's will. Even as a violinist must submit himself to the written score, so we must submit to the eternal plan of God as he unfolds it in general outline in the word of God and then in specific detail, note by note. Does prayer change things? Well, it does not in a small sense, but it does in a very large sense. For example, God knows that a wife and mother will die on a certain date. The husband and father will pray. The prayer does not change the death, but the prayer has brought the man into such conformity with the will of God that the death has lost all its sting, and the survivor is built in the knowledge of Christ and brought in such an advance of holy wonder that the heavenly Father has never made a mistake and that he does all things well, that death is changed and the prayer has changed it from something unacceptable to something that is acceptable. It is the Holy Spirit interceding within us with groanings that cannot be uttered who brings us into prayer conformity to the plan of God for our lives. I will add one more sequence to the story of the violinist, which will show how God brings us through the dark places. The violinist, by the time he'd been playing with the masters for 20 years, had come to the place where he was giving a creditable performance. There was a certain violin concerto which he loved very much. In the midst of the first movement of this concerto, there was one place where the violin played alone while the orchestra was silent. For some 200 measures, the violin played alone in a great cadenza which showed all the virtuosity of the artist and the musicality of the composer. One night, this piece was being broadcast during a great thunderstorm. A flash of lightning suddenly suspended the electric current. All the lights went out and the radio went dead. The man, alone in his room, in the darkness, began the cadenza and played on by himself. A dozen measures, 50 measures, a 100 measures. He gave himself to the music with all the desire of his being. Suddenly the lights went on again. After a moment, the tubes of the radio warmed, and to the intense delight of the player, he discovered that he was right with the great artist who was broadcasting. He hadn't missed a beat. He hadn't run ahead or lagged behind, but was in tempo, on pitch, and completely in the spirit of the artist. He had an overwhelming joy as he realized as a result of his experience in the darkness that he was beginning to be a true musician. And thus it is with our life with God. We learn to play the scales tremblingly at first. We grow with God in the Christian life. The Holy Spirit comes within to reveal to us the Father's will. And when the times of darkness come into our lives, for we will all go through days of darkness. We will play on in the will of God. When we cannot see his face, we will still trust. And when the light comes on at last, and we stand revealed in his presence, we will rejoice to know that he has taught us. And by the work of the Holy Spirit interceding within us with groanings that cannot be uttered, has brought us through into the eternal light. Thus, prayer changes things because it changes our attitude toward all things. Instead of our own will, we delight to do the Father's will, just as we shall be completely like him when we see him as he is. So we are even now growing into his likeness as the Spirit turns our eyes to him even today. And our God and Father, we pray thee that thou shalt use the message to the hearts of each listener. Take it to thy glory, that any who do not know thee shall come into submission to thy will through the cross of Christ, and that all who have trusted thee shall day by day grow in thy life and knowledge. We ask these things in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A powerful and effective prayer life is a sure sign of spiritual maturity. 
As we grow in Christ, we learn the ways of God and understand how to approach Him with holy boldness and expectancy. We hope you have benefited from today's message by Dr. Barnhouse entitled, Growing into His Likeness. You can listen to additional Bible teaching by the late Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse anytime, anywhere around the globe via the internet by visiting the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals website at alliancenet.org. An audio copy of today's teaching is available by calling us toll-free, 1-800-488-1888. Today's message again is entitled, Growing into His Likeness, or simply request message number R8-44. We would also like to offer you a free copy of our booklet, Abounding Grace. In his book, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, John Bunyan describes his despair over the weight of his sin before finding peace in Jesus Christ. Perhaps like Bunyan, you feel the burden of your sin pressing in on you. You may feel that you have fallen so often and sinned so badly that you have given up any hope of salvation. This free booklet will convince you that the superabundant flood of God's grace is available to cleanse you and give you peace. Ask for your free copy of Abounding Grace when you call or write. Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is a radio ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals headquartered in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We exist to promote a biblical understanding and worldview. Drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformation theologians from decades and even centuries gone by, we seek to provide contemporary Christian teaching materials which will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible comes to you through the generous gifts of our listeners. If you have benefited from this broadcast and would like it to continue on the air, please prayerfully consider a donation to help us keep this broadcast going. For more information or to make a contribution to support and further our work, Please contact us by writing Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, Box 2000, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103. Call toll-free 1-800-488-1888 or visit us online at alliancenet.org. Be sure to ask for a free updated resource catalog featuring books, audio teachings, commentaries, booklets, daily devotionals, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians, including Donald Gray Barnhouse, James Montgomery Boyce, and Martin Lloyd-Jones. Then join us again next time for more classic teaching on Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible.